Hey everyone and welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's Meet the Analyst webinar, covering our U.S. e-commerce sales outlook and top 15 retailers. I'm your host, Blake Drosh, Senior Analyst at Insider Intelligence here in New York City, and I'm joined by my colleague, Principal Analyst, Susie David Canyon, who is also joining us from New York. Hey, Susie, it's great to have you here today. It's great to be here. Before we get into the main presentation, I'd like to thank Nugata for making today's webinar possible. I'd also like to welcome Oren Raboy, the CTO and co-founder of Nugata. Oren is joining us from Tel Aviv. Hey, Oren, how's it going? It's going great, great, Blake. Excited to be here. Thanks for being here. A few things before we dive in. We have a ton of information to share, but there's no need to take notes. We'll email you a link to view the slides and the full recording but we do want you to participate. So use the chat window on the right to submit questions at any time during the presentation. We'll get to as many as we can during the Q&A. So with that, let's get started. Susie, can you tell us what's on the agenda today? Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me, Blake. I'm so excited to talk about all things retail. So let's get started. The last two years have each presented different challenges for retailers. And 2022 hasn't delivered on the promise of back to normal. Retailers are facing ongoing macroeconomic and operational challenges, as well as some new to 2022 factors, like the war in Ukraine and rapidly shifting consumer behavior patterns. Today, we're going to dive into our newly updated 2022 retail and e-commerce forecasts, which not only take into account our new reality, but also what we foresee happening into 2026. And then we'll take a look at some trends retailers can capitalize on today to help them grow their business. But before we get started, let's take a quick look at our data sources. We use a combination of proprietary data or forecasts, which for retail do not include food, drink, travel events and services. And for e-commerce specifically, we look at products bought online regardless of fulfillment method. Plus, we capture a wide array of secondary data, which are vetted syndicated resources. Used together, we can provide a more holistic view of the landscape. So now that we got that out of the way, let's jump into the presentation. Today, we'll start with looking at the retail landscape by channel, then we'll move to top retailers and category sales, followed by trends retailers can capitalize on now. It was so hard for me to pick a small handful because there's just so much going on in retail right now. But these are some of the more immediate ones that are on my mind. So I've been working in retail for over 15 years and I've never seen so much change in such a short amount of time. The pandemic did fuel online sales, but it wasn't quite as accelerated as some analysts had projected early on. As we'll see shortly, online sales still account for only 15% of sales. In 2019, digital sales were only 11% of total sales, so really not that big of a jump. E-commerce penetration will steadily increase in the next few years, but not quite as dramatically as some had thought. Well, except for maybe in a few categories, and we'll take a closer look at that a little later. So what has accelerated? It's consumers' expectations for fast, easy, and convenient experiences. Forced to adapt to the changing times, consumers tried many different technologies over the last two years and have now come to expect the option to use these. Just think about QR codes. Although in existence over 10 years, who was using these before we needed them to order at a restaurant? Now they're all over the place, bridging the offline and online experience. At the end of 21, we thought that we were finally turning the corner in a COVID world, but then 2022 brought about a whole new set of wrinkles for retailers and brands. In the first half of the year, consumers started spending money in different places. And then as inflationary pressures mounted and economic uncertainty prevailed, consumer spending patterns shifted again. Consumers are not only expecting a friction-free and easy experience from retailers, but they are now showing a heightened interest in value. And with all the market volatility and geopolitical uncertainty, consumer spending patterns continue to shift and shift even more quickly than they ever have. Plus, all the mixed media coverage isn't helping, and it keeps getting more confusing, especially after yesterday's disappointing inflation numbers. On the one hand, there are labor shortages and tight labor market dynamics, but on the other hand, mass layoffs in large organizations. The Fed is projected to increase interest rates again next month, impacting the housing and credit markets the most. 
However, consumers are still spending on credit cards and wages are still growing in some sectors, which is helping offset some of the price increases. The inflation numbers released yesterday sent the markets in a swirl, still at an all-time high, overall not decelerating as quickly as we had expected, and the core CPI increased, to the, increased over the last two months. But on last count, so in August, consumer confidence was starting to see an uptick. There are so many contradictory headlines, which really lead to the one question on everyone's mind. Are we in a recession? And if not yet, when and what shape will the recession take? Even the most famous economists and banks are not in agreement. This mixed bag of economic indicators, all this uncertainty is impacting everyone, consumers and retailers alike. We just went through all the Q2 results and none of them were the same for the retailers. Some of the high-end ones and the entry price point ones did gain ground, but it wasn't even. Some brands outpaced department stores and dollar stores were winning over off-price retailers. Even pandemic darling Best Buy is losing steam as consumers purchasing just necessities. But again, really who needs a TV every year? And big box retailers had a tough first half with so much excess inventory and a revision to their guidance. Our new forecasts take all of this into account. So let's jump into the forecast. As we all know, this is another tricky year for retailers to navigate. That said, spending was healthy in the first half of the year. And while inflation continues to put pressure on consumers, consumer confidence is starting to inch back up and consumers are still spending, although on different things. So where does that leave us? For 2022, retail sales will reach close to $7 trillion, up 6.4% to last year, and that's off of huge comps from 21. We expect sales will growth will temper into 2023 and beyond, returning to pre-pandemic levels, hovering at the 3% mark. So let's take a look at growth rates by channel. As we'll see, it's been another banner year for in-store sales. Consumers continue to flock to stores, and in fact, we revised our forecast upwards from our February numbers. If you focus on the gray trend line in the graph, you see another incredible year for in-store. Sales are, sales are expected to reach 5.9% this year, again, off huge comps in 21. And then sales will start to flatten. And by 2026, we expect stores to be more or less flat at up 0.6%. When you look at the black line, the digital sales, they saw massive growth in 2020, thanks mostly to the lockdowns. And then there was a tapering off until next year where we'll start to see stronger growth again. So let's look at digital sales more closely. We're expecting, this is a big year for e-commerce. We're expecting e-commerce sales will cross the 1 trillion mark this year and make up about 15% of total retail sales. So to put that in perspective of the countries that we forecast in terms of penetration, the US comes in at number six with 15% penetration. China is number one with about 45% of their sales online. And the UK is number two with about 36% of their sales online. Here in the US, e-commerce sales will continue to grow steadily. And we believe that by 2026, one in $5 or about 20% will be spent online. So when we all think about online, most people think about m-commerce and mobile apps. But did you know that the majority of e-commerce sales in 2022, so that 60.4% or the red box and the stacked bar are using a desktop or a laptop? And yes, there is a slight deceleration, but it's negligible with a projected 58.8% of sales on desktop by 2026. What isn't negligible though are tablet sales. They definitely had their heyday during the pandemic and we're seeing their share of e-commerce sales move really quickly down from 8% in 2020 to 3.3% in 2026. So that's the gray bar at the top of the chart. According to Kino Commerce Q1 2022 KPIs, desktop laptops have higher average order values and better conversion rates. So they're more volume and better for business. All that said, M-commerce, of which the majority is smartphone commerce, has become a more important part of the shopping journey. We just did a study on which mobile app features consumers value most, 
and we saw that features which connect the often online shopping experience, like inventory availability at the store of your choice or price checking while in store, rank high in desirability. M-commerce sales, which are either in-app or, this is important, on the mobile website, are projected to grow more quickly than e-commerce and will make up 40% of sales next year. M-commerce sales will grow steadily to cross the 600 billion mark in just three short years, nearly doubling in five years from 2020 to 2025. Of course, a retail presentation wouldn't be complete without a closer look at social commerce. To say that social platforms have been in the news a lot these last few months would be an understatement. We're hearing about new platforms and brands dabbling in things like Be Real, platforms like Be Real, as well as more mature platforms like Instagram pulling back on some commerce functionalities. But that doesn't take away from the importance of social in retail. It's definitely a place for consumers to discover, be inspired, and get educated. Along the way, some consumers will even make a purchase. We're not going to see strong growth in social buyers, but we are going to see average sale per buyers increase from $520 in 2022 to $940, so almost $1,000 by 2025. That's a near doubling in three years. And yes, the volume is still pretty low for social commerce. It's gonna reach $53 billion this year, but the, gro but the growth rates are very encouraging. So. Which are the most preferred social platforms? Like with all media and marketing strategies, it's important to know your customer, who they are, and what how you can reach them so that you can be more effective. But it also does help to know where the sales are happening. So let's take a quick look. While Facebook is definitely slipping, in 2022, it's still 62% of social buyers that are making a purchase on Facebook. Yes, that is definitely down from 68% in 2019, and we'll see the number will continue to drop to 61% by 2025. I'm looking at the red line in the graph here, but it's still 20 points higher than the next platform, which is Instagram. I think this graph really helps illustrate that big TikTok made me buy a craze of 2021, where we see that TikTok, the darker gray line, will over, overtook Pinterest in 2021. And over the next few years, TikTok will narrow the gap with Instagram. So before we look at the retailer and category trends, let's take a quick look at TikTok sales. Whereas the chart before was telling us what percentage of social buyers buy in any of the platforms, so you could potentially be counted twice, once for purchasing something on Facebook and once for purchasing something on Instagram. Here we're looking at the number of TikTok buyers. So in 2022, there were nearly 24 million TikTok social buyers. And that represents roughly one in four TikTok users who also made a purchase using the platform. To show you just how important TikTok has become in the last two years, in 2020, that number was 6%. So 6% of TikTok users in 2020 were also social buyers on the platform. Susie, is, is there uh, a reason be, reason uh, why TikTok is growing so fast in terms of social buyers? Uh, because of the demographic of its audience? Yeah, I think it's both the demographic and that it's like fun, easy purchases. You know, it's really well known for beauty, some food and snacks, some apparel. So it's really easy to showcase. And I think it just makes it so, and they're not super expensive. So it's easy, impulsive purchases. Right. So that means that TikTok would also have more potential uh, to keep growing as a platform for social buyers, even as uh, it gets a little bit older in terms in terms of audience because of the the content and how it's positioned. Absolutely, we believe so. It's a sticky platform. So with that, let's look at the top the retail landscape uh, in terms of top retailers and also how the categories will perform. In this chart, we're looking at the growth rate of the top fifteen retailers. The red line after Walmart is the e-commerce sales benchmark, which as I reminded, we projected it to be 9.4%. So all the retailers above Walmart all outpaced the market. Carvana continued to see explosive growth up 270% despite the changing landscape. I think the chip shortage was definitely an advantage as new cars were either really hard to find or extremely expensive in the first half of the year. Chewy, also a pandemic winner, will see sustained growth this year although not as strong as last year, because consumers have pets and they have to feed them. But that said, 
the company has given guidance that consumers are pulling back on the discretionary items for their pets like treats and toys as inflationary pressures and market uncertainty cause consumers to tighten their belts. One of the retailers that I think will be able to sustain its pandemic success in the longer run is Costco, who's been putting more energy in their digital capabilities and has a higher household income consumer base, which typically weathers the economic downturns a little bit better. So now let's look at market share. Sorry about the ISER chart, but not to worry, like Blake said, you'll get the presentation and the charts in an email later today. So Amazon still dominates, even though it is losing steam. It will account for 37.8% of US e-commerce sales, despite seeing its lowest gross mar merchandise value growth in over a decade. Walmart comes in at number two with a sixth of the market share. So said differently, Amazon's online business is six times bigger that, than that of Walmart's. In fact, Amazon's digital business is bigger than the next 14 retailers combined, and together, all of these 15 retailers make up about 65% of e-commerce sales. Of note is that Apple will leap ahead of eBay in e-commerce sales for the first time and move up to rank number three. Before we move into categories, one more note regarding Amazon. Amazon dominates when it comes to search. 61% of US shoppers start their search when shopping online on Amazon. That's 12 percentage points higher than search engines and three times greater than Walmart's website. Amazon has never been known as a place that inspires or helps with discovery. When you're searching, it's because you already have something you're looking for. But Amazon has been working hard to combat that to make shopping on their website more fun and emotional versus functional by trying different social commerce type features. It's, the la its latest foray is a TikTok-like feature called Inspire, which is a diamond widget on the website. And it's in, it's in a trial phase with employees with the purpose to be able to help promote more discovery. This is especially as important as Amazon is working hard to change its assortment mix and add more fun, fashion, beauty, and luxury goods to its website. So now a quick look at how the category shook out post pandemic as consumers started to spend on out of home products and experiences instead of pajamas and athleisure. First, let's look at category penetration. So this chart is looking at how much of the sales are online versus in store for each category. I think of note are two things here. First, there are only two categories where online sales will make up more than 50% of their own sales. So that's books, music, and video and computer electronics. Again, the story is not dead. And second, three categories will make up 52% of e-commerce sales, apparel and accessories, computer and consumer electronics, and furniture and home furnishings. We hear a lot about apparel and accessories, and with all the new fitting tools and other technology that retailers are trialing to help improve the online experience, it is important to highlight that this year, only one in three dollars is in this category will be spent online. So now let's look at some sales trends. As consumer confidence wanes, growth in non-essential categories like auto apparel and furniture will decelerate. There are only two categories, grocery and beauty, which will outpace 2021 growth. So let's take a quick look at those categories before we move into some current trends retailers and brands can capitalize on. So first, digital grocery. Digital grocery continues to grow and we anticipate it will grow 15.8% this year, reaching a little over $140 billion. The blue line represents its penetration, and as you can see, that's around 10% of sales. Everyone is talking about click and collect in all its different iterations. Our latest grocery forecast just published, and I know Blake, you're going to write a report about that, and that includes click and collect numbers. So about a third of digital grocery sales will be fulfilled through click and collect this year, and grocery represents about 50% of click and collect sales. So if you're a grocer and you don't offer click and collect, especially curbside pickup, you need to revisit this. It is now really table stakes, an expectation for consumers. And Susie, just to give you a, a little bit of a further uh, insight there, it's actually gonna go up to 40% by the end of our forecast window in 2026. So that's, you know, not only is click and collect driving digital grocery growth right now, um, but we're expecting that to, to continue. So yes, very, very important and going to be driving a lot more future growth in the space. 
Yes, absolutely. And you know what, before we move on to beauty, the other thing that we don't see on this chart because we don't have 2019, it's that the volume, the sales volume doubled from 2019 to into 2021. So that really is explosive growth and we're expecting grocery will continue to grow strongly. So like digital grocery, beauty also will see strong growth online this year and stronger than last year. This year's digital beauty sales will reach close to $18 billion, up 19% to last year. And by 2026, one in three beauty dollars will be spent online. And finally, before we move into some of the trends, let's look at the buyer numbers. I know everyone loves this information. So growth is not going to come from getting more people online since 90% of digital shoppers are already digital buyers. But growth will come from buyers buying more. This year, this fact was astonishing for me. This year, the average person will spend about $25,000 on retail purchases, up 5.6% to last year. And for e-commerce, that average is just under 5,000 per buyer, up $350 from last year, but projected to grow to $7,250 by 2026. So now that we've grounded ourselves in the forecast, let's look at some trends everyone's talking about right now. But before we get to the section, I think it's important to remind us and to reground us in that retail is all about convenience, speed, and reducing friction across the shopping journey. And it's always been critical for a good customer experience, one that will help drive repeat purchases and loyalty. And now in this era of uncertainty, I would add that offering value is equally important to consumers. Brands and retailers need to show consumers that they understand their needs are now working to meet them. So it's no surprise, that the, and it's one of my favorites, that the first trend I picked is private label. We ran a survey with BizRate earlier this year to learn more about consumers and private labels. What was once a cheap knockoff, the store brand, can now be a differentiator for retailers, helping drive repeat purchases, fill assortment voids, eliminate price comparisons, and help retailers have better control over their margin and supply chain not to mention a treasure trove of consumer spend data. Yes, there are a few headlines of retailers pulling back on their own brands, but it's clear from the survey that consumers are not only purchasing, but also open to purchase private label in a wide range of categories. Nearly 80% of respondents had either purchased or were willing to purchase pantry items, personal care goods, or even apparel. But like with all good things, retailers need to be careful not to skew too heavily into private label as some national brands in certain categories like electronics, for example, are needed to round out assortments and draw customers. This takes us nicely into our second trend, direct to consumer. So here we're talking about both the digitally native brands like the Warby Parkers of the world and the established brands like the Nikes. They are tweaking their distribution strategy to cut out the middleman. And there are lots of headlines on this strategy both in terms of digital and native brands partnering with established retailers and big national brands reigning in their assortment. D2C strategies afford the brand more data about their customer, a way to protect their brand, especially as we think about sales and couponing, and stronger margins. So it's no wonder that we're seeing more brands going this route. In 2022, we expect that direct-to-consumer e-commerce market to reach over $155 billion, that's up 21.3%, and outpacing e-commerce growth. And we project that by 2024, sales will be over $200 billion, and that's more than double from 2020. And it's almost four times greater than 2018. So huge explosive growth. Our third trend is sustainability. It's really on everyone's mind, and we're doing a lot of research about that here at Insider Intelligent. But there is some, there are some barriers to entry for consumers, and the number one barrier is that it's too expensive. One in two people find making more eco-friendly purchases expensive, which ties in nicely to my third trend, which is resale. Early this year, we published our inaugural resale forecast. And if you've been keeping track of the news, you know that pretty much every brand in every business is doing this now. Even Footwear Brand On just launched their Onward program. Today, there's a perfect set of circumstances that lead us to believe that sales will double in three years, going from 15 billion this year to 30 billion by 2025, and that's just for the online market. 
The two immediate factors being one, cash-strapped consumers wanting to save money all the while wearing brands they know and love, and two, consumers being more eco-conscious. And it's not just the purchaser who feels like they're being eco-friendly. According to a recent McKinsey study, nearly one in three consumers who resell their own items consider this their contribution to sustainability. And for a brand, it makes perfect sense for a variety of reasons, including having more control over their brand, the pricing, a new revenue stream, and new customer acquisition. According to Trove, which is one of the resale enablement platforms, 50% of resale purchasers are new to the brand. So let's switch gears completely. We talk a lot about some of the tech and I just wanted to really touch briefly on AR VR, which is really important to brands. Um, it is around four, we've used a biz rate survey and there are nearly 45% who have either used or are interested in using AR VR technology. So while it is not 100% there yet, as long as retailers can figure out how to make the experience easy to use, for the consumer and that is brand right and that will help it'll help with increasing usage and from a retailer perspective it'll help with decreasing uh, returns then also live stream shopping it's something we talk a lot about in terms of social commerce live stream shopping which is an extension of social is like qvc on steroids everything is happening in the same space and while interest in usage in live streaming is less than 50%, Klarna released their August Pulse survey where they discovered that one in three US adults start shopping journey, starts their shopping journey on social. And that 38% uh, of people who've made a purchase of a product have done so after seeing it on social. So as a brand, it's really important to have a social strategy and hopefully it'll lead to social commerce as well. And the final uh, trend for this deck, and of course it wouldn't be 2022 if we didn't have something about the metaverse, is around uh, virtual goods. There are lots of brands trying it. And I think here, the most important thing to think about is who is your audience? Uh, on a whole, it's pretty low in terms of interest and adoption. But when it comes to the 18 to 24 year olds, you see a big spike with nearly 50% having either purchased or interested in purchasing. So like everything else we talk about, it's really critical to know who your audience is and how you can capture them so that you can deliver an authentic experience. So with that, I would have talked about so many other things, but time is of the essence. So I'm gonna just go right to the key takeaways. Uh, we covered a lot of things. And so while you're reading, I think there are three big takeaways. One, retailers should remember that the store is still critical. Two, market volatility continues and media coverage is becoming more confusing. It's really important to think about the consumer and how they're tightening their belts and to drive loyalty, you really have to reach them where they are. And three, what we've learned from the last two years, and this I can't say enough, is that using last year to plan next year without an eye to what's happening in the world, without an eye to what's happening with consumer behavior is detrimental as inventory piles up and consumers don't find the goods that they're actually looking for. So with that, back to you, Blake. I'm excited to listen to your conversation with Oren. Thanks so much, Susie. That was that was great. I mean, I think, you know, there's there's so many trends here that we've been discussing really since the onset of the pandemic, but 2022 has been such a disruptive year that there's really an entirely new lens that we need to look at these trends through. So it's really interesting to get all the updated data and, and insights from you. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, so before we get to your questions live uh, from Susie's presentation, we're now joined here with uh, with Nugata's uh, Oren Raboy. Uh, Oren, thank you so much again for, for being here. A pleasure. Um, so... <clears throat> Leveraging data analytics uh, is, is really crucial for consumer brands, but we often hear about how this information is siloed across many different sources. Um, so Oren, can you tell us what steps that brands can take to optimize these data initiatives? Yes, I think you uh, hit it on the head when you said silos. The really the the core thing that uh, e-commerce organizations need to think about when they think about how to leverage data better in uh, in today's day and age is how to move away from silos. How to stop managing each and every one of the different uh, online channels by itself with its own set of tools and with its own uh, proprietary data, and really think about how to centralize everything in a modern data data stack with a central data warehouse and uh, use that to infuse data for uh, all the business users within the organization. 
Great. Thanks so much. And what are uh, some use cases for e-commerce <clears throat> teams that invest in uh, a robust data analytics platform? Yeah, great question. Well, um, what we see people uh, and, and these sorts of organizations use uh, data and use their uh, uh, data analytics platform for uh, use cases around digital shelf. That's probably the first and, and most popular of our solution. It basically helps them understand the competitive landscape uh, within a, a certain channel or across the, the omni channel, uh, matching between how people are searching for products and which products they're finding uh, and both their own and their competitors is kind of where many of these organizations start because it's just so useful information uh, for channel mar managers and for marketing managers uh, overseeing the particular channels. It's where you get competitive insight, where you can understand what some of your competitors are doing. You can discover new competitors and new ways and trends and how customers are searching for your product. That is all super useful. Uh, information that a good analytics platform uh, can be used for. And it's sort of a very popular use case as we're seeing it. Um, another really, really popular and useful use case is uh, what we call content recommendation or how to build perfect content for your uh, portfolio uh, on any channel and on all channels, whether you're um, trying to optimize uh, the way your titles and descriptions and the metadata on your products appear and, uh, on Amazon.com. So it uh, more closely resembles how customers are searching for your products. Uh, that's uh, something that smart data analytics and smart um, machine learning uh, used correctly can really help you, right? Generate uh, and improve the, the way you're describing your products to match better how customers are searching for it and what some of your competitors are doing. Um, that's another use case we commonly see people use their analytics for within this context. Um, another really, really popular use case uh, is something that really consumer good companies have been doing um, forever, but it just has become so darn hard to do on for uh, digital and, and, and e-commerce, which is uh, price packaging analysis, all right? You're trying to figure out, especially if you're selling uh, fast moving products, How? what is the right way to bundle them together? Uh, do you um, sell a five pack of your um, of your skincare product or should you do two packs? Uh, what is the right pricing and what is the sensitivity around that? Uh, there's a lot of information online, but these sort of analyses are very, very hard to do uh, because that data is hard to get by, it's hard to organize and it's hard to make uh, uh, and turn it into analytics friendly data that you can use to run these sorts of analysis. And with um, a strong foundation there, you can really take all that data, use smart uh, AI to clean it up and really make it accessible for, uh, for further analytics. Thanks. Yeah, you know, I think that that ties so well back into Susie's slides, looking at growth, uh, online e-commerce growth for sales of, of essential goods, the digital shelf, just getting so much more crowded and complex that positioning the content in order to stand out uh, is just getting so much more important. Um, so, Oren, how should uh, in-house data analysis work for a modern organization? Is it still common practice to have a single data science or analytics team that's feeding information to the rest of the organization? Mm, that's a that's a really great uh, great question. Like um, this is actually changing uh, a lot, and especially we've seen uh, I think tremendous progress uh, just in the last uh, two or three years, where a lot of the fundamental uh, data science required to run these sorts of analysis have been. Um, I wouldn't say commoditized, but have been made much more accessible to users outside the realm of data science. Um, so, you know, a few years ago, to do anything of the use cases that we just described, you would essentially have to build everything in-house, starting from how do you collect the data, how do you build the different uh, machine learning uh, models and networks in order to produce it, and how do you scale up and, uh, and maintain pipelines to, to drive that data and keep it uh, fresh and, uh, and, and current. Uh, but today there's a growing number, and that is a, is a really great example of that, but there's a growing number of, of different solutions that uh, help you do that without the need to develop it all in-house for the common use cases. And so the pattern that we're seeing emerge is that you definitely uh, 
need and want to have an internal data organization and data science organization. And really every organization wants to have that, but they really want to focus there on the proprietary challenges and the unique uh, aspects that they have on their business and try to leverage as much as they can from off the shelf tools, whether it's pre-made models that they can easily apply on their data or engineering tools that help them move, move data around from, from, uh, from point to point. Uh, and what we're uh, seeing uh, right now is that a lot of this is being uh, um, commoditized or not commoditized or simplified to the point where uh, business users, uh, we like to call them data savvy business users that know their way around uh, um, uh, spreadsheets and know what they're looking for data, but you just do not have the resources and time to keep all that data organized and set up. Um, they um, use these tools and, and get the data that they need in a, in a much simpler fashion um, and really enables business level analysis to focus on cleaning and understanding insights and not so much on moving data from, uh, from point to point. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, really interesting. And just last question, uh, what are some of the technical challenges that consumer brands need to resolve when it comes to having a, a robust data analytics tech stack? Yeah. Um, when you think of your data stack to drive uh, e-commerce, um, your, your e-commerce data initially, um, you're looking at four core components. Uh, one is about collecting and harmonizing data. So one of the real big challenges for creating meaningful, useful analytics data in, uh, in uh, this uh, CPG and retail environment is that every uh, different channel, ge generally speaking, uses its own data sets, its own uh, uh, product identifiers and so forth. So you end up even trying to understand how well products are performing across channels and how well advertising com campaigns are uh, are performing becomes really, really uh, complex. It's hard to map one-to-one, -one, uh, even as, as simple as one product to another. So harmonization is really a place where you can apply smart data, data analytics and AI in order to achieve that. Um, enriching data with external signals is also really important to include in your data stack. So it's one thing to take your own operational data and harmonize it and make it analytics friendly, but often to get to a really good picture of what's going on and uh, making data actionable, you need to pull data from external sources, from the web, from third parties, uh, and mash it all together. And, and doing that is another big challenge from a technical perspective and from a data perspective. Um, third is about applying smart uh, machine, machine learning models, uh, whether it's to predict on uh, future demand or to um, generate content recommendation. Uh, these sorts of models that you can use and, and, and use to train your data and, and kind of continuously uh, use to evaluate your, 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 your status and, and situation is really, really important, whether it's to uh, improve and optimize or whether it's to forecast and, uh, and detect, uh, detect the trends and breakage of them. Uh, and last but not least is how do you build it all together and turn it into something meaningful and actionable for your actual business consumers, the ones that will actually be using the data? So a lot of this goes all to also into figuring out what's the right way to visualize the data and, and how to package it into actionable dashboards or actionable reports that the actual business users can use on a day-to-day -day basis. Great, thanks so much, Oren, really appreciate it. Um, Oren's gonna stick around for the Q&A, uh, which we're moving into right now. Uh, we've received uh, a lot of great questions. Um, uh, one that actually just came in, um, Susie, you mentioned in your presentation that the store is not dead. I know working with you, it's a phrase that you love to utter over and over again, reminding us as a team. Um, are there any thoughts that you have about digitally native brands that are opening retail locations? It's obviously a trend that goes back, um, but as e-commerce matures even more and we see that penetration number inching up. Uh, is that still going to be a trend that we see in the coming years? Yes, absolutely. And I think, you know, it's the, there's like two tensions sort of in terms of the trends, right? There are brands that are trying to go at it alone and go directly to the consumer. And then there are the original direct to consumer brands, what we're calling digitally native brands that are now trying to use a middleman or go or 
do stores, right? And I think part of it is that cost of acquisition of a new customer is so, so hard. And in fact, we talk about this on the podcast uh, for Friday's podcast. There is a surprise in that podcast, by the way. Uh, it's the weekly listen with the game. Um, but anyways, back to the question. So what I would say is not, not only do I think digitally native brands are going to be opening more retail locations and we're seeing that happen, I think they're going to look for creative ways to partner with bigger, bigger retailers and bigger retail operations that already have put in the capital into building out the stores where they can do more pop-ups and sort of exper experiment, experiential sort of ex uh spaces within either a department store or a big box retailer. So it really cuts the cost and it allows them to have access to a whole whole new group of consumers that they never would. And uh, for example, Peloton is now selling on Amazon, not, not exactly retail location, but it's the same idea around working with a middleman. Great. Thanks so much. Um, and then another question that just came in, uh, what about luxury goods? I think, you know, as uh, economic uncertainty continues, different, uh, you know, demographics are certainly impacted more than others, which in turn impacts different businesses. Um, are there any insights that you have uh, in terms of how, you know, the luxury goods sector is doing as a whole and, and how they might fare uh, if uh, economic uncertainty sort of continues into the coming months? Yeah, absolutely. We just, we just, uh, I think today published a report on luxury goods. So we're still seeing this bifurcation. And I think it just depends on how we define luxury goods. If you're talking about the super high end luxury goods, the Louis Vuittons of the world, right now they're fine. It's the aspirational luxury where it's that sort of middle household income consumer that is feeling a little bit stretched with inflationary pressures. And although the price of gas is coming down and it's predicted to come down to at least under $3 relatively quickly, it's still pressure for the consumer. So that aspirational luxury brand is feeling a little bit more pressure than the high-end luxury groups. However, after the market tumbling, I think high-end consumers and high, high wealth uh, households are not as worried about the price of gas or a little bit of uh, increases in price of food. But when the market starts to tank, that's when they start to pull back. So I think that if we continue to see the market uh, in disarray, there is a chance that the growth that luxury goods have been seeing for the last few years will start to taper. And this this next question, uh, and it, it kind of you know flips the previous question on its head. Um, we're seeing that, you know, people are still planning on spending on things like Halloween, um, even in the midst of, of economic uncertainty. Why are people spending uh, despite the fact that the cost of their everyday essentials, especially food and beverage, continues to grow? You know, that, this is one of my favorite questions uh, around just gift giving occasions. And when times are tough, People try to band together and look for small things to celebrate and to bring joy and delight, whether it's to their kids or to their families or their friends. I think what we're seeing now is Halloween spending is pulling forward because both retailers bought their inventory too early because they weren't sure what was going to happen with supply chains. And consumers have started hoarding because they just don't know what to do. You know, it's like behavior that we have learned throughout the pandemic and that we're continuing to do. For Halloween specifically, I think, you know, it's a no-brainer. Candy is not super expensive. You can have a fun night. Uh, the world is sort of half falling apart. And so if you can just bring a moment of joy, it's what economists call the lipstick effect. It's why we see some small luxuries that do keep... Uh, their sales volume high and see strength in sales when times are tough. Thanks. Um, and Oren, this next question is for you if you want to hop in. Um, we kicked off the Q&A talking about D to C's. Um, from, a, from a data analytics point of view, uh, for D to C brands that are unsure of how a, a data and analytics stack could help improve their revenue, what are some things that they should be looking at? <clears throat> Um, so the, the the things to look at when you when uh, we're looking at DTC is really around how are you uh, tracking uh, company uh, consumers from the top of the funnel all the way into into the uh, 
into the into the store. So it's a, a lot of it is about how do you uh, again harmonize and connect the dots between what's going on on your different advertising platforms and what's going on on the site itself, uh, just so that you know how to where where come where where do where and what sort of campaigns to attribute incoming traffic so you can optimize accordingly. Uh, so that's typically where you would start. Um, what we often see, and Susie uh, mentioned that also in her in her uh, presentation, is that as you uh, grow uh, as a digital brand, one of the first things you look at is how do I expand beyond uh, my D 2 C channel into the into the marketplaces, whether it be Amazon or Walmart or or many other, depending on the type of products that you that you offer. And there, the harmonization challenges become even even tougher, right? How do you correctly route traffic, so to speak, between your Google campaigns into your D2C shop? Uh, how do you treat advertising spend across uh, the in-market advertising platforms on Amazon and Walmart uh, and uh, what you're doing on Google and, and Facebook and, 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 and all of the others? Uh, that's where really some of those uh, uh, benefits come into play when you, uh, when you work through how, uh, and build out your data stack. Great, thanks. And and also related, um, Amazon is arguably the most common marketplace for vendors. Um, but are, is there reasons why brands can't solely rely on the metrics that they're getting they're they're being provided uh, just through Amazon? Is there uh, are there there are additional places where they should be looking? Um, definitely, I think. Uh... Every one of your, uh, every one of the places where you sign up for every channel, there's data that is available in that silo. But um, once again, the, the real value comes into play and you can really start optimizing and, and, and growing and using data to, 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 to fuel that growth. When you look at things across the different channels and kind of harmonize and collect all the data together and, and Amazon data is, is, is you know, obviously and squarely focused on what's going on in the Amazon platform. So that's one reason. Uh, the other reason is that um, at the end of the day, Amazon makes uh, a lot of data accessible and available, but uh, often, um, I mean, data in and of itself is not of, 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 real, of real value, right? It's the insights. Uh, it's only as good as the insights that you can glean out of it. And in many cases, this data is very, very noisy. Um, so, um, and, and very hard to... Uh, fully leveraged without using pretty sophisticated analytics uh, techniques that you can only achieve once you kind of uh, build out your, your stack. So being able to apply uh, machine learning models to predict future traffic demand is something that Amazon doesn't offer. It gives you all the data. You can build something like that if you, uh, if, 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 if you have the skills and the, and the time, but, but often that's, you know, it's usually outside the domain of what you can achieve. Uh, with your uh, analytics resource as uh, as an as an e-commerce brand, um, but you should definitely try to look at how how to incorporate that, and that goes well beyond what Amazon has uh, available in in kind of its uh, uh, seller and advertising platforms. Great, thanks so much, um, Susie. What are some app features that could help smartphone commerce become a bigger portion of e-commerce? I know you put out a benchmark report on this earlier in the year, so it's teed up nicely for you. Totally. Well, and I think it's an interesting question, right? Because it's not what makes consumers use apps more. It's how can we get consumers to buy more on apps? And what we found in our research is actually consumers use the app to facilitate their shopping journey and they tag, they, they go, they toggle between in real life and online as they're doing their shopping. So I think if you wanted to make a, a bigger portion of your e-commerce sales, your app, it would be really about facilitating the payment. The digital wallet is really critical. Uh, things like scanning gift cards into your mobile wallet, which is a very valued feature, but not offered by many retailers, although they have the technology because you can do scanning uh, of pictures and price checking. So I think uh, ensuring that your mobile wallet it is really strong and ensuring that your imagery on your mobile app are really easy for the customer to understand, 
because, you know, we already know that they're buying basics and replenishment items on mobile apps, but they're not necessarily buying fashion because I think it's hard to see on the small screen. So figuring out how you can make your product information easier for them on the app will also help with increasing e-commerce. It's really all about how do you make it easy for the consumer to understand what they're buying and easy to discover. Sometimes filtering is really hard on the small screen. So just making it as easy as you can so that there is less friction so that the consumer is then more apt to purchase versus just use for discovery. Great, thanks. And we've got time for one more question. So I want to wrap it up uh, by looking into, I'm sure, you know, what's on everybody's mind. Uh, this is the holiday season. Uh, as a marketer, what should we be thinking about to ensure that we have a successful holiday? What are we anticipating? What are we already seeing? And how should we think about reacting to it? I mean, th this is the crystal ball question right now, right? There's just so much uncertainty and every day we're hearing new economic indicators that are sort of throwing curveballs. I think if you had asked me this question a week ago, I would have probably had a different answer for you. Uh, we know from before the pandemic that folks start buying gifts earlier. So I think we can probably assume that with every all the chaos from the last two years, that this will not only be true for this year, but it'll probably be even earlier because people are worried about not getting the gift that they really want to give. And people are worried about prices increasing. So as a marketer, I think you need to focus on value, focus on ensuring consumers know that you have the products that they're looking for, make sure you get to them even earlier. There is rumor that Amazon is maybe gonna do another event that'll surely kick off the holiday season. Um, even earlier than ever before. The other thing we did, we used to do a lot of research on this in my, at my old company. And the other thing is I think we forget about the holiday season as self gifting. So as we're thinking about Halloween and other gifting where people are looking for fun, sort of cheap ways to, to add delight to their life, it's going to be the same this year for people who are going to be doing self gifting. So make sure that you have items that are not super expensive, that are affordable and fun and delightful so that you can elicit extra spend versus people just spending on others. Great. Thanks. Well, unfortunately that's all the time that we have for today. Um, but thanks again to Susie for joining us and a very special thanks to Oren and to the team at Nugata. Our e-marketer production crew who's operating behind the scenes also deserves a huge thank you for making this webinar possible. And as promised, we'll be emailing you a link to all of the slides and the full recording. Before we wrap up, uh, let's take a moment to tell you what's happening across e-marketers media channels. You can register for upcoming live analyst and tech talk webinars at emarketer.com slash webinars. On the audio side, don't forget to tune into Behind the Numbers, eMarketer's daily podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts. And finally, please check out our newsletters. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your workday.